Hey, good morning, and welcome to, welcome to episode 70 of Talking to Artists. So today I am doing the interview from the headquarters of Art Walk in the Square. We're in the process of marking the art, uh, marking the, the uh, booth spaces so that everybody can have a uh, good space, stay six feet apart, so good distance, all that kind of stuff. So of course, that makes it a lot more challenge than it sometimes is. Um, wanted to also just um, apologize because we had our opening for our family garden show last night, but Helen and I were so heads down doing the work and getting the panels and getting everything done that we actually forgot to promote it. And apologies to all of my uh, Jewish friends. I also completely blanked about the date. So of course I had no intention actually of trying to do an opening on Yom Kippur. Uh, so I will apologize for that too. Hopefully you can come out. We've rescheduled it for next Friday, a week from tomorrow on the 24th, Lesley Grove Gallery, seven to nine. So hopefully with enough warning, uh, we can have a couple people there enjoy the work because it looks amazing in real life. So anyway, today I'm super excited to talk to James Fowler. So not only rising TikTok sensation, but amazing artist. I have one of his pieces myself and I love it every day. So let's see if James is on board. Looks like he is. Fight him right along. Hey. Hey, gorgeous. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? I'm a talking head in a box. <laughs> Ooh, you're looking pretty gorgeous yourself. Although I have to say, I just love those long curls. You had oh, your COVID curls. I know. They're all <laughs> gone. It was, um, you know, co COVID had these various effects on people. I gained a lot of weight and I grew my hair and it was like down here. And, you know, my mom, when I was young, used to say, um, grow your hair and have it curly. The girls will love it. <laughs> like, but mama don't like girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure but the boys will love the, it too. The, I the, thought it was amazingly sexy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it was, it was fun. But the thing about curly hair is that you get like one or maybe two days out of it where it's like, it looks really great. And it's like pH balanced and you've, you've like blown it out. <laughs> it looks really awesome. And then the rest of the time you're like, e -e 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 -e. like it's just like, hi, this is my hair. And it sort of does what it wants. So I'm looking a little shiny. Um, oh, it's hot. I know. Well, having yeah. completely dead straight hair, I can't say I truly sympathize, but now yeah. maybe you can, as you can sympathize with all those poor women that have to deal with curly I think hair. It, I think it's one of those like grass is always green. And like, I have friends that have poker straight hair and I'm like, Oh, the things I could do with that. I remember when yeah. it was long, I had somebody flat iron it for me. And I was just like, I oh, look like Bon Jovi. Been... <laughs> <laughs> it must have been so long, though. <laughs> it was. Like, it's amazing, like, the sort of shrinkage that you get from, from curly hair. Um, but, yeah, it was yeah. Like, sort of down to here. Um, and my partner, Rick, likes short hair. So he sort of, like, was like, yeah, yeah, it's okay. And then when he cut it, he's like, I love your hair. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's awesome. So it was, well. I mean, it, it was fun for what it was. It was you know, kind of on a bucket list. And the good thing about it was that I was able to, when I was finished, um, I was able to donate. The, um, there's a company in Canada, I forget the name, I apologize. But um, you, you, you have to have, I think, uh, nine inches, and I had 11. And so I was able to cut it and donate it to a place that makes wigs for people who are going through um, cancer treatment. So it was just really nice that my hair was going on to have some other life. It wasn't sort of going in the garbage. That's so, amazing. Yeah. My my daughter did that. She was about, I don't know, eight or nine years old, and she somehow came across that. Maybe she was 10. Um, and she cut up, I think it was like 22 inches. Like That's a lot. Dead, dead straight. And I guess with children's hair, too, it's finer. So they're really like, it's pretty excited to have children's hair for right, the wigs for cancer right. because it has a different texture. Yeah, yeah. They, You've they got some ombre stuff going on here. Tell me about that. What's that about? I do. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because I had, of course, through COVID, too, I haven't had my hair done. So then I realized, wow, I've got a lot more silver <laughs> i prefer to think than gray than i thought i had <laughs> and i was just starting to feel i don't know isolated and old and decrepit and uh, and so before cabbage town it was literally the friday night i'm like i just need some color so i just like put this put the color in choo -choo. <laughs> you're, like, you're like here let's just tea dye there we go it looks, it looks yeah great. pretty awesome. much That's very awesome. unprofessional anyone who's looking at it will see how very uneven it is Whatever. and then um my sister's here for our show right and uh it's funny because a lot of times when we are together, people think we're twins, which we're not. So on the Saturday night, she was having a shower. I'm like, let's do your hair too. So she has the matching. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, yeah. do, you, do you have do you have the compa like? Are you close in age where um, you sort of you like like oh, I'm the I'm the younger one sort of thing, or is there like that sort of sibling rivalry or no? No, she's uh, I'm six years older, five okay. and a half years older. And you so own when that. we were growing. 
you own that, no, you're well, like, yeah, I'm wiser. <laughs> <laughs> no, so what ended up happening, an interesting story, because, uh, you know, when we were growing up, we were at such different stages. We really weren't competitive because we were at such different stages of our lives. Right. There wasn't really that need. There's, I mean, I've got a brother in between. And then probably about 15 or 20 years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine who's the youngest. And at that time, she was like 40. And she's like, holy shit, my oldest sister still treats me like a baby in the family. And I'm like, yeah. I wonder if I do that to my sister. So we had a good conversation about it. So oh, good. I, I feel like it's, um, it's definitely more of an equal, equal relationship. And especially mm -hmm. doing this, because we're doing this partnering show we just launched yesterday with Family Harmony where we worked on pieces in, in connection, like in uh, the pairs were done in kind of uh, collaboration. And that cool. was very interesting too, awesome. because we realized after three weeks of intense stress, we're like, holy cow, we haven't disagreed. We haven't fought. We haven't been angry with That's each awesome. other. We have an issue. We talk awesome. it through. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's been awesome. It's, it's, uh, it's nice when you can work collaboratively with people and it's just really fluid. It's sort of like, you know, when you see old friends and you can be silly with them um and and there's like there's no pretense and it's just like hey you're this 16 year old kid i remember you're like, but you're, I know. You have, but you have adult money now <laughs> yeah that's good so. but then you get the pictures back and you're like oh i shouldn't be dancing like that yeah, at this age. <laughs> yeah it's really funny i have um i have friends so i grew up in north bay uh and i spent my uh my summers up in tomogamy but um so there's a newspaper in north bay called the nugget and there are people who, who are from North Bay. I guess there was a story where there was a bunch of people from North Bay at someone's house and the person's partner had gone to bed and um, the North Bay people, because, we're, you know, I come from culture where it was like, you'd have like bush parties and stuff like that. That was the sort of like, it was like hunting and fish, fishing culture. Um, and so all the teens would like from the diverse, different high schools would go up on like a ski hill. And then, you know, I remember one year there was like a tree that got lit on fire and the police were everywhere. But anyway, so... So, and it's kind of kooky and a little bit bananas, but, um, you know, we go up with this sort of North Bay diaspora goes out in, into the world. Uh, and when they meet up, they sort of start to behave a little bit like these North Bay people again, a little kooky, um, which is, you know, to each their own. Uh, anyway, and I guess uh, the person that was sleeping, the partner got up and he just said something like, you know, you effing nuggets and so, cause, <laughs> because so it sort of became this sort of cute thing so there's like the the envy nuggets and it's like oh yeah <laughs> hey you're a nugget too huh um, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of cute uh and i have friends that sort of keep that alive which is nice yeah that's fun well it's always good to uh, i mean it's interesting too with this show we're doing the family garden mm -hmm. just kind of you know really embracing your history and your experiences are what make you who you are right so mm -hmm. you have to kind of embrace and enjoy them as opposed to try and you know, carve off parts that you might not necessarily right. want to remember. Now, what, what, is this a new project? Is this is this in its first year? Or is it is it been going on for a while? Or I'm curious. Uh, to which, know. Oh, the one with Helen? Yeah. Yeah. No. We well, we actually originally we had started thinking about it because we wanted to originally do it where we would both collaborate and work on one painting together. And you know, Fun. she's in Vancouver Island. I'm in Toronto. So mm -hmm. when COVID hit, mm -hmm. that wasn't mm -hmm. possible. And then we were supposed to do the show in June. Mm -hmm but I couldn't get wood panels that were the right size because everything is 60 inches tall. So the concept is working in harmony, kind of like singers singing together. They have their individual voices, but together they create something beautiful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. the pieces were all 60 inches tall as if you're looking out the windows into a family garden. And it's an homage as well to our grandmother, who's an artist, the fact that we're both artists in the same family and come from a creative family. Right. So, and so is this, is it, is it, is it, is it two artists and they're sort of, it's going back and forth or is it one person's working on it and then the other person's working on it and then that's it or that is it was, a conversation or? Well, so that was the original concept, but it didn't, it wasn't really feasible with COVID and with transportation. Right. So what we did is through Zoom calls, we basically said, okay, this is the color palette. This is the shape. This is the idea. This okay. is the inspiration right. of this piece. And then we would, we would kind of partner. So then I would work a little bit on my version of that. And then we go back and forth. Cool. But what kind of happened is that, it was, it only really started to come together when Helen came to Toronto about three weeks ago, because then all of a sudden it's like, oh, that color looks so different in right, real life right. than it did on screen. Right. And so the last three weeks have been crazy because we've been just like touching things up and we hung the show. Oh, then our, of course our frames were, were delayed. So everything was super stressed. And then we hung the show, we finished hanging it yesterday um, and in part in their partnerships in their partners. And yeah, the opening was supposed to be yesterday. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I think I forgot to promote it. And uh, it's Yom Kippur. Oh. So really stupid choice. So we're doing another oh, well. opening next Friday. Yeah, but it looks, it looks amazing. Like it was so, 
right. emotional to kind cool. of see it all together and that it really fit. There's sort of so. a, I guess there's a history with artists too. I, I know that there's a history with particularly around sketchbooks and stuff like that, where there's a sketchbook that gets passed around. Um, I do know on TikTok right now, there's um, uh, a, a few folks, I, I think there's like seven or maybe nine of them. And it's this one artist who, and again, you know, I'm terrible with names. It's like, you know, I, I remember people's names by who they're married to or in a relationship with. Or, <laughs> or their dog. Know. Is that is that like James Rick James or James the doctor? It's like, no, James. Yeah, yeah him. Okay, cool. Like, you ask me somebody's last name. I'm like, I don't know. Um, yeah. But um, but there's this tradition. Anyway, so on, on TikTok, there's this person. And what they're doing is a fundraiser. And I think it's a really cool idea. And I'd actually lo love to do it. So if you ever want to do something like this, let me know. But um, what it is, is they've, I think they're working on one... I think it's a pay. I think it's actually on paper and one person. And so one person is like an animator. One person does abstract work. One person does sort of like low poly kind of stuff. One person's a scenic paint. Like they all sort of have different disciplines within painting or, 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 or figurative work or whatever. And so one person is starting it, sending it to the next person. And each person is sort of almost like that. What's that um, thing where you have that monster and it's like three pieces of paper. It's called like the, fabulous oh. monster or whatever there's a name for it anyway yeah. so each person sort of adds something to it and at the end they're actually doing a limited edition prints where they're all signing them and then they're they're doing a fundraiser with it and i'm like that is i want to do that that sounds cool that's awesome so yeah. so so yeah i mean like if you ever want to do anything like that let me know we'll get a I'd bunch of, we'll, yeah. get a, we'll get a bunch of abstract painters together and just, <laughs> like let's make a mess <laughs> Well, and I uh, interviewed Kat Tesla from Georgia about a month ago, and she did that. And I believe awesome. that she actually collaborated with an artist that she didn't know. She did her part. She sent the painting to them. Mm. And at the end of it, they had an exhibition. And the work was just stunning. But I have so much more. I already admired her. But after doing this with my sister, I have so much more admiration for the ability to let go of the ego with your own work. Right. And, you know, and do what needs to be done without worrying about stepping on the toes of the other artists. Because I think that is kind of a challenge with collaborations. Yeah. And there's a there's a sort of a, a negotiation that happens like you, you, you like um I, I remember in in high school there was like a a, a, dra a drama uh, exercise where you couldn't say no you would say yes and and it was sort yeah. of like you took whatever the information so whatever the other person's adding to this you're like yes and and then <laughs> and sort of keep the story going without sort of canceling other people's ideas out so um yeah I guess it would also be an exercise in, in sort of con control or like giving up control or sharing control because as, as independent artists, we're so in our own heads sometimes, particularly in the zone when you're working, right. Where you're like, you're going at it. And then if somebody is to disrupt that, right. You, you sort of, you're disrupting that idea or that flow for you. You're like, okay, well now how do I renegotiate or how do I reimagine based on whatever's you know whatever information has been given out i remember um yeah uh kim dorland did a show at the mcmichael a few years back and i remember what was really interesting about that and that's a, this is an artist artist relationship but an artist curator relationship where they took um the curator took a bunch of paintings of tom thompson's and kim dorland sort of responded to the paintings that the curator had put out. And I, again, I forget her name and I apologize. Um, but then, <laughs> but then what was really interesting in terms of building conversation was uh, Kim, so I guess, responded to these paintings, um, presented them. And then based on these paintings, the curator went back into the collection and found more work that was sort of related oh. to what Kim had painted. And so there's this really interesting conversation that happened. So I just think it's really interesting to sort of see how artists or artists and curators or how curators can build conversations, whether it's between two artists or whatever. I just think yeah. it's sort of an interesting well, idea. We had, uh, I just did it was part of a show at uh, Two Gallery and they did the same thing. So I'm there, they represent me. So as artists, we were invited to go be curators and invite somebody else, another artist out, and then either work collaboratively or choose a piece of theirs that you felt was kind of worked with yours. So right. I, I chose Claire Desjardins and cause I love her color and right. her energy and stuff. And so then created a piece that was inspired by hers. And the show was, I didn't get to see it in person, but online it looked so amazing. Right. And uh, I saw some of the pieces, but it looked super cool. Yeah, yeah. That's great. So it's a cool idea. Anyway, we shouldn't be talking about me cause we're supposed to be all talking about you. So, oh. <laughs> 
Sure. I have to tell okay. you. Let me tell I, you about me. I, I love, I just want to say to, first of all, that I still totally love the, I think what was it called? Summer in Toronto painting that you right. did for us, the commission. Right. Yeah. Um, I still have, I still have not found my secret piece yet. So it's part of it is still missing. Um, but we still love it all the time. Right. It's right. A, so. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm, maybe people who don't know my work. Um, I wasn't uh, sure if it was a secret. <laughs> no, no, it's not a secret. So since 2008, I have been hiding the word love in my, in my artwork. Um, and, and I've also added, um, if somebody asks for a commission, I've often hid people's names. I remember doing a painting for someone and they were laying on their couch. I guess they had hung the painting above their uh their fireplace and they were laying on the couch and they sent me a message I'm like did you put our kids names in the painting i was like yeah and they said i found one <laughs> i was laying on the couch and i saw it it's very bold right yeah and sometimes i you know um i did a painting where i put uh, my partner rick's i put his whole name through the whole thing and you would never see it but as soon as it's pointed out to you you're like it's blatant you're like wow it's so it's so interesting because <laughs> we, we found so we found miranda's immediately right. um like probably because it was longer so you have more of that pattern right um i have not found my name yet so it's, it's there. kind of but it's there i know i'm sure i'm sure it is so it's i have there. to look sure but for people it, get but. excited i get i get texts often afterwards they're like we found love and i'm like yay yeah i'll get well i just think it's kind of sorry go ahead it's cool too though because like now it's a print so now like our family's names are kind of in these other pieces right. that are all over the world right and that's kind of right fun. it's been an interesting evolution working from uh sort of exclusively doing commission paintings to moving towards prints and and even more so doing hand embellished prints. I actually find it really fun. Um, in twenty maybe seventeen, um, I was the I was selected as the multiple artist for Art Attack, which is the fundraiser for Buddies and Bad Times here in Toronto. Yeah, uh, and we did twenty. So we did twenty prints, and I hand embellished them with. Um, um, a gouache and the gouache just blends right into the painting like you can't tell the difference between where the print is with it and so each one of them were different i did this sort of cool animation where it was the name of the painting was called um juicy fruits which was uh, a painting of sort of the church <laughs> in great. wellesley area and it was all sort of kind of fruity colors um, um and uh i took photos of each finished piece and then i did this sort of um not a rotoscope, but this sort of little animation loop, uh, which I thought was really interesting. And it looked like all of this moving traffic. So I thought it'd be really kind of uh, fun to sort of keep doing that uh, afterwards. I had such a great experience with it. And so when I did the painting um, for a doctor who's out in Vancouver, uh, and it was, it took me three years. It was six feet by six feet. Um, and it's, uh, it's called, Paris. was that the Paris at midnight? Paris at midnight. <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah. And the one thing that I like, I, you know, at, at first I was like, it doesn't look like it's at midnight. It's too bright. And then, um, I turned the, I turned the lights out of my studio one night and I was, it's the first time I've ever worked with metallics, metallic paint in my work. And I caught the painting out of the corner of my eye and the light from my studio from the hallway was sort of raking across the whole front of it. And that's when it sort of hit me. It was the, all of the metallic paint just sort of was glowing and it looked like Paris at night. It had this sort of bronzy sort of patina over the whole surface of it. And I was like, this is awesome. And so I thought, well, how can I recreate this as a print? <laughs> Excuse me. And so um, I worked together uh, with, um, um, a, a printer in Toronto and um, when I did the print I he gave me a test print and uh, I, I just sort of hand embellished it all with like gold paint and I again I was in my studio and I had my phone with me and I turned the lights out and I just took the light on my phone and I passed it over the surface and because the print is super saturated and it's really matte and, and part of it are quite dark um, the whole thing just it sparkled across the surface of it I was like yay it worked um, oh, that's so, so great. I, I did a, I did a, I think I did like 20 of them and that was it. Uh, I think I have like two left. And then I did another painting similar to yours. I had someone who actually saw yours and said, I really like the Toronto line. And so I was like, oh, I can't do like Toronto in summer. So I was like, I'll call it Toronto in June. <laughs> it's a slightly different color palette, but um, it was sort of around this idea of June and parades and things like that. Uh, and then again, I did another um, short run of hand embellished prints 
And then I started thinking, you know, I'm making more money off of these hand embellished prints than I, than I am on the original work. And so I've got uh, in my studio right now, I'm working on a four foot by five foot of um, Los Angeles. That's all in Ooh. neons that I'll do prints of and it'll all be in sort of neon paints, um, sort of very electric looking. So that's kind of what's that going amazing. on in the studio right now. So yeah, yeah so, far, so, so far so good. <laughs> And so how did you get started with the, uh, the kind of the aerial maps? I know you talked about the kind of an homage to Canadian landscape in terms of, I mean, I think you're totally right. The Canadian landscapes are so integral to every Canadian painter, even if you don't paint traditional landscapes. Right. It, it, Canada has a long history of, of landscape painting. Um, you know, we have this whole mythology around sort of the group of seven and, and, and painters, British painters that came over before that. <laughs> um, and so we have this, this whole group of people that are, you know, that want to say that, um, you know, the, the spirit of Canadian painting is it lies in the land and it's in the, in the, in the animals and it's in the hills and it's in the rivers and that sort of thing. Um, and then you have this whole group that came out of, um, Montreal in the, I guess the fifties, the, the automatists and, and they had this other idea that, you know, it's in the, it, the, the spirit of Canadian art is in, um, it's in the people and it's in the culture. And so what I've tried to do is take my work and, um, f fuse the two somehow, make a blend of the two. And mm. so often my, my work is, uh, you know, I, I would describe it as non-traditional landscape painting because it's still landscape painting, right? But it's from above. Absolutely. So what I'm yeah. often doing, I did a, a short series um, of, of paintings of, of group of seven uh, sort of iconic paintings, you know, um, Tom Thompson's Jack Pine and a bunch of other ones. Um, and what I did was I took the original color palettes from them and um, used the same size canvas and then found where they would have been standing to make those paintings. And they did aerial paintings of them using the same color palette. So oh, I kind of so wanted cool. to, you know, it would, it would be really nice one day to be able to sort of put them side by side and see like, you know, what they look like. But um, uh, so I, so I've done that. And what I've tried to do is, is pull from the, the architecture, the, that vocabulary or that those color palettes or what it would be like to go to, um, you know, uh, uh, Havana in Cuba and what, like, what colors are you going to see from a street level and then take those colors and then apply them, apply them to maps of those areas. Um, I'm working on a project right now called Capital Cities, which is 197 capital cities from around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. They're small paintings. They're quite, they're, I could do these small little commissions. They're like 12 by 12. They're quite simple. But I'm using the color palettes that are associated with, I guess, that country's brand. So their flag, what is their national animal? What is their national bird? You know, the flora and fauna. And then also looking at that city and looking at the colors of the architecture and then building a unique color palette for each city. Um, and then I've got, I've only got about eight of eight, eight of them done. <laughs> And about another so it's a fifty-year project. Right. It's a fifty-year project. Well, the thing is, you know, <laughs> you know, you, it's, there's that balance that an artist has too, right? Where you you're like, okay, I have these commissions to do, and then there's the other stuff that you want to do, and you're like, well, I'll just get this other commission done, or I'll get this other thing done. Um, uh, and so you set goals for a year, and I uh, the last two years I've sort of put it off and put it off. And so it was this year with COVID and stuff that I was like, okay, I need to dedicate some time to that. And so that's what I've been doing. I've sort of squirreled away on my studio and getting them done or I'll, I'll stay up late and watch movies on my, on my computer and, <laughs> and work on them here. So, um, hmm. but so that's that, I mean, that was the, the origin of it. Um, when I uh, uh, was young, um, I spent my summers in tomogamy. Uh, on an island uh, with my family and we would go to this bookstore up in uh, I think it was in Cobalt and they had all these maps and I thought it was really cool and so every time we went I would get a new map and so there was sort of a map and then I'd get the map that went beside that map and so I had sort of the whole tomogamy area on my wall uh, at our cottage um, and, and so maps sort of I just thought they were really fascinating and I thought they sort of told stories and like who lived where and when and and I became interested in that and then I spent many years my grandmother um, went to the Côte de Beaux-Arts in Montreal uh, in the mm, 30s um, so I come from a line of of painters but I spent 
later high school and university of working in, I was working towards a, a film degree and I, I didn't want to be a painter. And I was like, I'm going to be a poor artist. And so, <laughs> um, so I ended up working at Canada Newswire and doing news and information distribution and, and working in a sort of suit and tie thing and, and feeling like a, a Charlotte. I'm like, this is so not me. I hate this. Um, Maybe I'm a painter. <laughs> yeah. And, but the thing is, is that through, through it, I kept painting. And um, one day I was, uh, it was actually uh, the wife of a colleague of mine who I became friends with. She was over. And so what I would do is I would invite people to come over. A couple of people would come over and bring wine and they would paint. And I would, be, it, would it was like keeping company with people who were non-artists. Uh, and I let them be creative. I put paper and stuff out for them. And I made this painting and she really liked it. And then a couple of weeks later, somebody came by and they said, how much do you want for that? And I sold it. And so I made another one. It was just these sort of really simple grids. Um, and I sold that and then I made 10 of them and I had a little show in, in Toronto's uh, East End in some little cafe and they all sold. And I was like, okay, I'm onto something here, right? <laughs> it's like a, it's yeah. a happy mistake. Uh, I found my thing. <laughs> I found my thing. Well, it's really, and it's funny because when an artist finds their thing, you, it can be a trap too, right? Where you're like, oh, I want to, I want to explore this. They're like, no, 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 I need another map. Pay me another map. Can you do one in Montreal? <laughs> yeah. like, can I have another one in Toronto? I'm like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's, so that was the sort of the, the origin of it. And over time, um, you know, I've gotten really, really detailed with them. And then I started um, uh, in 2011 when I started doing the 10 by 10 photography project at the Gladstone Hotel, which is the, the annual exhibition that celebrates LGBTQ uh, artists uh, in Canada. Um, I started a fundraiser called the Artathon. And so I was doing, uh, so I would get a bunch of artists together and we would do these 10 by 10 paintings every hour on the hour uh, for 24 hours, which is a little bananas. But one of the things that it taught me was to just not be so precious with my work, right? It's like yeah. quick and dirty. What, like, how much can I paint in one hour? And we would sell the work and half the money would go to the artist and half the money would help pay for the books and stuff like that and the exhibition. So, um, but uh, out of that came more people afterwards saying, hey, can you, can I, can I still get one of those paintings? Uh, and so that's been my, my bread and butter probably for the last uh eight or ten years now you know and i have mm -hmm. like people who are waiting for them so they're they're like hey when's my painting gonna be ready <laughs> but it's, in, it's interesting it's interesting though sometimes when you have those uh time constraints and you don't have the luxury of looking at it and sitting back and thinking about it and i find it's interesting sometimes those are pivotal moments i think that change the way you work like sometimes you can become just that much more efficient or you create a new technique because you need to be faster and that ends up being a technique you're like that's super cool and now i'm going to use it right. on everything Right, right. I actually, I had to change my style to become more efficient. And so that's, there are these simplified, more simplified maps. Um, and I, and I developed a process for doing those. Um, but okay, I have tried to, the, those paintings that I do with the squares, I have tried to, to find other techniques to make them more quickly. And, and they, it just doesn't, like, I've tried using stamps, I've tried using like, sort of some sort of uh, um, printing process where I can print and it, it, it just does not look like a painting when it's done. It's just, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's a, you know, painting is a really sort of time honoring process. And, and I admire people who can, um, you know, take a big thing and make a big swoosh across a, 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 a canvas and sell it for, you know, 50 grand. I'm like, good for you. Um, I'm going to not make, I have to say, I have to say though, that's that a lot of that type of work, like, I mean, because I always consider myself that I paint fairly quickly because right. the actual final act of painting is fast, but there's so much other work that still has to go into it that is sort of completely, um, right. you kind of forget about, it. like for me, my backgrounds take me ages because there's so much staining and prepping and, you know, right. all that kind of stuff. And so it's like, interesting. whenever now, now I look at those big swooshies, I kind of go, there's a lot more to that. <laughs> a lot oh more yeah, time absolutely. And it looks like. And it's all the it's all the mistakes that happen <laughs> along the way, right? You know, you look at people like Callum Schaub, who's like, you know, made a career out of this these big swoosh paintings, and I'm like, bully for him, good for you. He's yeah. now selling his he's selling his shoes for like I don't know, like 
2500 bucks or something i'm like awesome that's great <laughs> um and yeah and, and, we you know, figure always, out how to do that <laughs> right and it's always the sort of there there are other artists or or non-artists who are like well i could do that i'm like you could but you know, you have to pay for a studio rental space and you're going to have to do years of experimentation to get really good at it, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, and that's one and of some the of those paints, and some of those paints are super expensive too, right? right? I right. think people yeah. forget. Like, you know, if you're at that level, you're not buying kind of the uh, inexpensive studio stuff. I'm buying Absolutely. Liquid Mirror that's like, I don't know, $95 for a little, little pot, for a little you know? Thing of it. Right, right, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's so there's all of that overhead and there's all of that work and all of that time. It's the, you know, the designer that can work and get something done in three minutes. They've worked years to be able to do that thing in three minutes. And that's why yeah. you're going to be paying them a lot of money because it only took them three minutes. It didn't take them three months to get it done and they know what they're doing. So, um, yeah. but, but, but going back to my own process, um, there's just been no fast way of doing it. And I also, I mean, in addition to that, you know, when you're when I'm working on something that's quite large, it can be um, ment mentally grueling, right? Where I'm working on a painting that's six feet by six feet, the entire background, the underpainting is black on black on gray on dark purple and dark green. And then I'm putting like <laughs> every white square that I put on that, that painting that I did of Paris, I had to paint three or four times. Right. So it's yeah. like, you know, and then it's because I'm working in acrylic and it just doesn't have that. Sort and it's of tiny effect. little brushes. <laughs> and they're tiny, like the, the smallest square yeah. that I think was two millimeters by two millimeters on a six by six. Like I was I, at, the, at the end along the Seine, I was like, literally, I was like, I'm, I'm making street lamps. I'm draw. I make, I'm doing paintings of street. This is ridiculous. What have I done? <laughs> like I'm getting to like this. Is, so, I mean, I think it's probably the, the most detailed painting that I've, that I've done to date for that yeah. size. And that's, um, you know, that's been a challenge for me to get, you know, okay, I've, I've gone really fine. I've gone really detailed. Can I now loosen, loosen up? And so one of the things that I've been in my studio in the last year experimenting with is using um, like oil stick and oil paints and try to paint a little looser and so i've got a couple paintings that i'm working on right now uh one of london actually two paintings of london one is of um uh oh my goodness uh it's piccadilly and right beside piccadilly it's long and then i have a square one that's all of uh but it's like neon pink and silver and black but it's much mm. looser than the, the the square stuff that I, it's more like blobs so we'll see how that goes oh cool but I think, it, but I think that is exactly the type of work that uh, lends itself to prints, right? Because, you know, it takes so long. So presumably, it's also fairly expensive, and it's out of the the price range of a lot of people. And by doing prints and embellished prints, they can still love the work. You can still sell the work, and without the pressure of having to paint yeah. faster. Yeah, I remember years ago on a on a first date with uh, Rick, uh, I was introduced, I was saying, what kind of art do you like? It's always a test when you date somebody, <laughs> like, what kind of art do you like? And he's and like, he, well, and he said high realism. <laughs> no, he said, I, my mom really likes Trisha romance. And I was like, who's Trisha moments. And I w went home and I looked her up and she does those sort of pastoral paintings of like um, houses in, um, and it's not really yeah. my thing, but whatever, like everybody has their, their own thing. One of the things that's really interesting about her career as a commercial artist is that, uh, I don't believe she actually sells her originals. Like she just, sells the prints and her prints are like oh. one of like 16,000 or something like yeah, yeah. So, and she sells so, a lot and she sells a lot right I mean she's she's very you know commercially viable and people love her work and it wasn't until years later I was uh doing a residency in Bancroft Ontario at Owl, uh, Owl Ridge I was there for three months uh and I went into this store and and lo and behold is a Trisha Romance um framed print so I bought that for him for Christmas uh <laughs> <laughs> and he loved it, and it's and it's great. But what what I did learn from Trisha Romance was that um, you could, like I said, you can make more money off of your prints than you can off of originals sometimes in terms of like how yeah. much you can sell if you do like a limited, a very short limited run. Particularly the hand embellished, because I feel like that there's still a physical process for me. It's not simply like I've I've done a print of it. I mean, people who are printmakers, that's one thing. But people who are doing uh, like G clay prints or something like that. Um, you know, and it's gorgeous art paper that it's on. Um, it's like the Hannah Miller, like bright white paper, which is gorgeous and it's really thick. 
but that I'm still going back in as an artist. And so each one is an, an original in itself. So that's been kind of a yeah, fun I, I also think there's something about the hand embellishment that kind of regenerates the energy of the piece. Like I always feel like the, mm -hmm. with an original painting, you get kind of a, an energy of the artist as they're creating it. And I think with mm -hmm. hand, hand embellishing, you're sort of imparting a bit of that energy back to the print, which I think is kind of nice. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, you know, I'm, I don't know. I just, for me as an artist, I just feel like, uh, I feel like there's still, yeah, there's a, there's a new energy that you put into it and it's like, it's still coming from me. It's not coming off of a, some print that I'm like now signing and like, <laughs> like what? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, yeah, yeah. through You're all like, of I'm that, go some money today, I'm going to go print some money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I wish so, it was I that know, easy. I just, yeah. Yeah. I just anyway, so that's and that's why I've I've gone through a list of, of cities that I know that I want to paint. Um that I know that and, and this is the thing with art too, is like as as I move on in my career, like my work is you, you used to be able to get a big painting from me for five hundred bucks, which is like I think of the people that own those and I'm like, good for you. Um you, you <laughs> yeah. got in early you got in early on the game. Um, and then, you know, it's like, not like my work is going to get any cheaper. And, and I joke with Rick that like, you know, I'm going to be worth something when I'm dead. Um, but, uh, <laughs> people, not everybody can afford, um, um, original work. And so prints yeah. make it more accessible to more people. And that's also partly yeah. why I did the small paintings, the little 12 by 12s is that like, like I said, not everybody can afford a four by five painting in their house or want that. You know, some people have don't have space. big houses or have space, right? Yeah. Some people have these small art collections. I mean, if you look behind me, behind me, I have a collection of like really great small pieces that I've collected of Canadian artists, of people who I love and admire and people who I know. Um, uh, and I, we have a small condo, so it's not like, uh, you know, I can put in a, a four by five in my own place. So doing a print yeah. of that makes it, makes it a fee financially feasible for people but also that they can like have this like nice collection of of original prints or something or limited edition prints so yeah from, from a business point of view too i mean it's very smart for the artist to do prints because you have this continuing annuity stream of stuff they've already done so you're not always only right. selling the work you're producing right and right. i mean obviously i'm talking to the choir and i keep talking about prints everyone who's followed these podcast no I keep talking about it and I haven't actually got my shit together to do it yet even though I know it's a good idea <laughs> we'll talk it's really funny because I feel like um you know when you have when you find like the relationship that an artist has with their uh the person who documents their work and then does prints of their work it you know it's sort of the secret sauce you're like like oh who does your printing I'm like I'm not telling you that <laughs> 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 I know, but it's hard to find that, right? Because, right. I mean, you get to the point where, well, a camera phone, as good as it is, is not going to be good enough to take the quality of photos you need to do large right. prints, right? Right, right. And, so. the, and the thing is, is that as much as I know about my own art practice, like, you know, to have a great sort of symbiotic relationship with somebody who really knows what they're doing in terms of prints and can do all kinds of different prints and documents the work in a really great way that I can, I mean, there's a, a piece on, I was talking about that juicy fruit piece um, that I did for Buddies and Bad Times. Um, the the person that documented that work that's that was the beginning of our sort of working relationship. Uh, and he the the scan was so well done that they were able to blow it up like it was like thirty feet long and it was printed on uh, canvas. Wow. If you actually go down Church Street right now, <laughs> um, just north of Wellesley, there's a record store there called Dead Dog Records. And all along the whole top piece, that's a piece of my work um, that the building developers out of Alberta uh, used while the building was oh, still Oh, very up. cool. So, I mean, it was, I think it was supposed to be there for a year and then there was a delay with um, their design or something like that or getting approvals. So it's been there for a couple of years now. So we'll see how long, it, <laughs> how long <laughs> that lasts. Um, but yeah, well, so, that's amazing. So, so, so having a having a great printer, I think you know. I mean, if I was talking to somebody who, um, you know, wants to get into printing, is 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 hunt around. Um, there's some great places in town, but um, you can find somebody who works more quietly to themselves, an independent person, and and get them to document your work. Because I, I, I mean, do you document your own work? Because I, I don't. I can't. <laughs> like, I've tried. I, it, I do. I do. I do. And I shouldn't really like I have a whole setup right. with the lights and stuff. But I find honestly, I seem to be 
you produce it and you send it. Like there's times too, when I finished a piece and I'm like, I didn't even, I have no record of it, which is so unprofessional, but sometimes it's just right. things are fast. I, I but have, I've, I've I'd like to get better quality. My, I, it's, yeah. So I, in my studio, I have a setup so that like I have lights too, that I can document it. That's good enough for web or, or just for having like a, you know, a document of my, of my work. But when I get into prints, I want something that's like super high res and that the person, the other thing too, is often I'll work on either board or I'll work on canvas. Um, and a really high res image is going to capture like that, the actual texture of the, of the canvas, which I don't personally like. Some people love it. Um, and so the person yeah. that I work with is able to like actually take that texture out. And so it's this nice, very oh, cool. flat, clean, looks like a silkscreen print, which is something, you know, um, I haven't done with my work. Um, and, I, and I know a few people who work in silkscreen. I think that that's something I want to experiment with over the winter is doing some sort of print work of, of my work. It would be really great to be able to take like a print, like large rubber stamps of like Toronto and stamp that down and then hand embellish those sort of thing. I don't, I don't know. We'll oh, see. yeah. Yeah, I mean the thing is, with map make, like with with my practice, there's so many different ways that I I can go with it. I have a um, a sketchbook, and I don't actually keep sketches in it. I just I wake up every morning and I write down like ten different ideas. I have my morning coffee; it's part of my ritual. I'll look at some art books and I'll like think about like how can that be applied to what I'm doing. Um, and so I have these these, and then on the back side of each page. Um, I'll go back through it and, and write down sort of further ideas. And then when that page is filled, then it's sort of like, okay, well, that idea is a little bit more cooked than the other ones. So let's, let's try that. Let's see what happens there. Oh, that's a great, that's a great practice. Yeah. Well, you so know, how do you find like, time? Uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, how do you find time with all of the other things you're going on to now become like a TikTok superstar? <laughs> TikTok superstar. <laughs> Um, uh, you, you make time. The thing is, is that, um, uh, social media is an interesting animal because it works differently than sort of traditional marketing and it, and it, and it's a different animal and, and each platform has its different audiences. Um, and one of the things that, you know, TikTok is sort of the new kid on the block and it's got a, you know, I mean, it's got everything from teenagers doing dances to artists who are you know well recognized doing really interesting things um i tend to you know i was when i first started it was sort of like i, I have no idea what i'm doing and like you know four months later i've got i don't know seven thousand followers and i still don't know what i'm doing um but you know it's, it's you know i think one of the most important things when you're working on any platform is is really thinking about not only who your audience is but the audience that you want to attract so um I have in the past been like, hey, look, I'm dancing with my shirt off. Woo! And, and then you have that whole audience <laughs> of people that are like, and then, I, and then I'm like, hey, look at my art. And it has like 40 likes. And they're like, do more dances with your shirt mm -hmm. off. <laughs> Where's your shirt? <laughs> like, you know, I'm yeah. like, I'll stick with you. I'm like, here, Rick, take your shirt off and hold my artwork. And it's like 5,000 likes. I'm like, yay. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. I mean, like whatever you put up, there, that's the kind of audience that you're going to attract. And so there are people who have really – done a, a slow a slow growth of like this is um you know i'm setting up yourself um with your phone um if you go to the dollar store in in canada or i guess in toronto anyway and you go into the tech section they have a little clamp thing that you can put your phone in that has a little wiry thing i think it's like four dollars um it's a it's a it's a great little um um, piece of plastic uh and i've just set it up over top of my work and so while i'm working um, there's an app called, um, what's it called? It's called stop motion. Uh, it's a free app. Um, and you can actually turn it on and you can set the intervals. So like every second, it's going to take one frame of your work and I'll set it up with the, sort of this crane looking neck thing and I'll put it over my work and I'll just be painting. Uh, I'll do like an all nighter and paint for four hours and then it will, every second, it just takes one frame. And then it builds this whole little stop motion thing at the end. Um, so you're, you know, it's a great way to show process stuff. Um, but I tend to sort mm -hmm. of like, I'll, I'll get up in the morning, I'll get a bunch of ideas out. And then um, 
I have um, uh, like a, a sheet that I, I do every morning of like, this is what needs to get done today. These are my top three. You know, I, if I'm not, if I'm not organized, I'm not organized. Like I have to be like, really like, this is what needs to get done today. Um, and if I don't do the sheet, then it's like, oh, I'll just go play Fortnite for a minute. And then four hours later, I'm like, okay, maybe I'll get some work done. <laughs> so, you know, and that's the thing with, you know, being, being your own boss as an independent, as an artist, like you have to, you have to be so disciplined. And if you're not, it can, yeah. you know, oh, I just don't want to paint today. And then you feel like crap because you didn't do it. <laughs> so, well, but, yeah. and I think, and I think for me that that's just a big lesson learned for this past show too, because normally I do the same thing. I have my list of five things, like these things have to be done today. So mm. they're not, and it's mm. not like, you know, create a painting, right? It's broken down. So you can actually deliver those five things. And I've been so involved in kind of this collaboration and really struggling with trying to find my voice with doing this show that I right. dropped all that stuff. And, and you really see the repercussions of, I mean, I, I, my background's marketing, right? So it's like, hmm, marketing is really important <laughs> to get the work it, out there. It is. It doing the work was great, is. but. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. and I always, I always thought like, you know, a person who opens up, a, you know, and I had considered it for a while, but I was like, oh, you know, uh, years ago, um, I, you know, when I was working for Akimbo, it's amazing how when you work in arts administration anywhere, how that can eclipse your pra your practice or, or knowledge of your practice. Um, I was doing like art and tech writing and I was doing a bunch of their social media and I only did it for a couple of years. But and I and it got, you know, I was introduced to a lot of really amazing people who work in the arts um, through that. Um, but then I, I was talking to somebody, I was at an opening at Mocha and I was like, oh, well, I was painting last night. And they're like, oh, you're an artist? I'm like, yeah. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> it, like, it's, a, it's about like all the different hats that people wear, right? So, you know, you're talking about yeah. how you're organizing this thing or you're part of a, a collective or you're like all of the administration that goes into that that all chips away at your time. And that's why I have to do this thing in the morning where I write down, okay, I need, and, it, and it's incremental things. It's not, um, I do work on this painting. It's like trace this part out or, you know, put down this yeah. stuff or get this stuff done. And those are my top three. And then I have like a, like a little schedule for the day and those major three things go in and it's like, okay, that's going to take two hours. That's an hour. And then I, and then I fill in the spots okay, I have time to go do this. So I have to go pick up this frame or I have to go get this done. Um, and if I don't do it, then it just doesn't, it doesn't get done. And then I also do another one. It's like what's happening this week. It's like studio time, studio time, studio time. Um, it's like paying yourself first. If you don't, if you don't write it down, it just, I don't know, it can, it can run away from you. Wow. Like you're way, way more organized than I would ever even think about being. <laughs> It's but taking, it's I turned 50 this year and it's taken me 50 years to, to, to be that organized. And I, st and I'm still not like, I'm still like, Oh crap. I have this other thing I have to do. You know, like if I, if I, if I don't write something down, yeah. if, like if I'm talking to somebody and, and they don't see me pull my phone out and go, Oh yeah. What day are we doing that? What time? Like it's just, it's never going to happen if, if you, if I don't write it down. Right. Oh. It's like you have to manifest no, it. I'm like that too. Like it <laughs> If I don't have it in my calendar, it doesn't happen, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I'm an incredible list maker. Like as soon as I can see, feel myself starting to get a bit stressed, I'm like, I need to make a list. <laughs> so I right, can right. get out of my head, onto the paper that I know what I'm doing, and then I can build a plan for it. Like I'm very right. much of an action-oriented right. person, so. Right. But uh, I, was talking about, I was talking about the different hats that we wear. Uh, one of the things that I am working on um, with a couple of other artists at the Art Gallery of Mississauga is we're doing, um, it's called the Love Lab. This is the second year that I've done it. I didn't do it last year. I think it was the year before that I did it. Um, and what it is, is it's, um, it's sort of intergenerational. So it's um, sort of older artists working with um, um, uh, queer and trans youth. Now youth, I think it's like 18 to 20, I think it's like 26 or 27 or something like that. So these are sort of younger artists or, or people who are like sort of ready to take off. And so there's, it's a mentorship program that I'm doing. So I have that responsibility and then I'm, you know, I'm helping other people with some of their social media. So I have that responsibility. And then I have like the various projects, like, you know, how you have your main, your staple of what you do, like this is whatever your bread and butter is. And then you have other little projects that you want to work on. And so yeah. I have to every month go, okay, this is the project I'm working on. I need to work on this. Cause you know, it's, what is it? You, you can control your, you can control, you can control your direction and your velocity. 
and and if you control your direction and your velocity is only slow, at least you're still working towards something. Um, and so at the yeah. end of the year, I can like look at like, okay, I got this much closer to that goal. Um, and um, so like the, the Capital Cities project won't happen until 2025. So it's, it's the long play, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's really smart because I think I, I'm also one of these people too that I, I tend to say yes very quickly. Like that sounds like fun or I really like the people. And so you kind of say, yes, right. I'll do it. Or yes, I'll commit or yes, be part of it. And not always fully thinking about what are all the other commitments I already have committed to that I have on my plate. And, right. you know, invariably for me, the thing that drops off, which is ridiculous is the studio time, you know, because all the other right. things have external factors kind of right. that are pushing you. Right. So I'm learning to try and say, no, I'm not doing very successfully at it yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> right. And I think that that's a good thing that, you know, that all artists are able to say no to certain things because you're saying yes to your studio time. The number, the number of times yeah. that I have in the, you know, when I was younger, I would say like, yeah, I totally want to do that. And I want to do this and I want to do that. And, and then like you're saying, you don't have time for your studio time. And then you're like, well, how come I'm not able to produce enough work or, or I can't put together a body of work quickly enough. I'm, I'm having a show, you know, every three years or something um uh and it's and it's because you're not dedicating your time to your own practice and it's it's great that you're out there yeah. you know but it's i don't know um i find like i can get in my own my own w way sometimes and it's and it's like well i'll just work on this little other project and it's like well how how much is that that you want to work on that project or how much of that is that you're just putting that in your as a pylon to sort of get around so that you can actually get to doing you know what you really want to be doing and i think that that's what came for me with covid and and being home um alone one of the projects that i did get to work on was um i did a, a an exhibition at the art gallery in mississauga called being alone together where i actually set up my studio in the space which wasn't actually accessible to the public uh for a period of time part of the time it was um, and so I was doing something like this where I was going on to Instagram and I think I was doing it on Facebook as well, where I would just turn the camera on and you could sort of watch the artist in the fishbowl. And I would sort of check back a little mm. bit. Um, uh, and so it's a, it's a six by six painting that I'm working on. That's all white on white on white. It's called Anthem. Uh, and it's now in its second year of the process. So this is something I'll also be working on over the course of the winter. Um, but it's, you know, oh, that's I mean, so cool. Artists are, Artists have been really isolated through this. I don't know if you've, if you have felt more isolated, but the, you know, going out to artist talks or going out to panel discussions or going out to exhibitions or openings. I mean, this is the time where artists like get to like see other artists and talk to each other. And, and there's a sort of a synergy that happens and you're like, Oh, so and so is working on this. Or you sort of have an opportunity to catch up on what other people are doing. Um, and, yeah. and it's, and it's like before a talk where you see somebody in the lobby and you get to chat with them for five minutes. Um, that was my social time with other artists and other people in the arts. And when you took that away, it was like, what the hell do I do with myself? <laughs> so, um, oh, I know. And getting, and getting the, the right energy to create. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I totally get it. Yeah. Hence these conversations. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? For me, that uh, was I mean, great. I'm a, I'm a anyway, we, believe it or not, we're actually, Oh, oh yeah, well I know are we me out too. Of time and I, already? Are I, we done? I think That's I know it. we are. Can you believe it? <laughs> I have like fifty things on my list I didn't even get to talk to you about. <laughs> oh okay. Well, we can do a part but two if I, you want. <laughs> I would love to, but I always like to end my uh, my interviews with: if time and money and everything were no option, what would your big hairy ass goal be? Uh, I would like to be working in uh, sculpture and I would like to be working uh, specifically in um, construction grade steel, casting in steel. There are not a lot of places that do oh, casting cool. in steel, lots of places that do bronze. Um, I discovered pig iron at an exhibition at um, uh, um, uh, the ROM uh, a few years ago and it was these, they were these hammered pots uh, made of iron and I was just like oh, wow that's really amazing so I did some research on it and like I said it's an expensive process and not a lot of people do it um, but I have this fascination with men's business shirts and I would love to build casts of them in 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 construction grade steel 
Um, you know, maybe a commentary wow. about patriarchy or something, but, uh, you know, maybe I'll put that on my bucket <laughs> list. You know, life, life is short and it's like, well, how much, you know, how much do you want to commit? How much time do you want to commit to a particular type of your practice? Right. And if you can't commit any more than, you know, a double espresso, then you're not going to sort of move very far. Um, and so very true. It's, yeah. it's, it's an, it's oh, an idea. That's, that's my timer. The, oh my God. Uh, so yeah. So <laughs> I'm I, sorry. I, I have to cut you off. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> okay. That's, I'm done. I've loved the conversation. I can't believe the time has gone so fast. I just want to make sure I can right. save it. But okay. thank you so much. I really love right. connecting with you. And mm. uh, yeah, absolutely. Good we'll do part two. You. Thanks so much. Good talking Talk to you too. To okay. Bye. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye. Okay. And uh, thank you for joining us. And just want to remind you that Art Walk in the Square, if you're in Toronto, is happening this weekend at the shops of Don Mills, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And um, if you are in Toronto, the Leslie Grove Gallery has uh, my family garden, Converging Harmonies. It's a show with myself and my sister, Helen Utzel. I invite you to check it out. And as usual, this will be posted on my Facebook and YouTube and eventually a podcast uh, when I can get the time to actually transpose it. Anyway, have